All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for rating and reviewing us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you listen. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Matt Lewis. I am excited to have back today's guest, Jonathan Taplin. Uh, He's had an extraordinary journey that's put him at the crest of every major cultural wave in the past half century. He was tour manager for Bob Dylan and the band in the 60s, producer of major films in the 70s, and executive at Merrill Lynch in the 80s, creator of the internet's first video on demand service in the 90s, and a cultural critic and author writing about technology in the new millennium. He's out with a brand new memoir. It's called The Magic Years. Jonathan Taplin, welcome back to the news. Good to be here. I thought we would start having you regale us with some stories, and then I would transition into a more of a normal interview. Um, first, talk about how you ended up in the music business to begin with, because it seems like you kind of lucked into it. So I was 18. I graduated high school, and I was headed to Princeton. And my brother had a friend named Paul Clayton, who was a fairly well-known ethnomusicologist, which is a person who studies folk music. And I had been a fan of Bob Dylan for a while. This was 1965. Um, And I'd gone to see him in concert a few times. So I just said, I'm going to go to the Newport Folk Festival and see if I can get in backstage. So this guy, Paul Clayton, was a very close friend of Dylan's. And so he got me the backstage pass. Uh, And then he introduced me to uh, a guy named Jeff Muldar, who was in a band called the Jim Queskin Chug Band. And they needed a road manager. And their manager was a guy named Albert Grossman. And Albert Grossman was Bob Dylan's manager, Peter, Paul, and Mary's manager, Paul Butterfield's manager, pretty much everybody important in the folk music business. So I found myself in Newport, which turned out to be a seminal period because it was the year that Bob Dylan decided to go electric. And so on a Sunday night, Dylan showed up with a kind of thrown together band made up of mostly the Butterfield Blues Band, Mike Bloomfield and the Sam Lay and Jerome Arnold, the rhythm section, and Al Cooper, who was an organ player. And they came on stage on a Sunday night in a sea of 10,000 folkies in blue work shirts and, you know, (laughs) the traditional garb. And there was Bob in an orange shirt, tight pants, English high-heeled boots, and a black leather jacket. And they started into Maggie's farm. And when it ended, there was just total silence in the audience, no cheers, nothing. And then a few boos. And then they launched into like a Rolling Stone. And when that was over, more boos. And it was like, you know, those famous things you hear about where, you know, the rite of spring in Paris or something, these kind of cultural events where there's a extreme pushback. And it was the folkies thought rock and roll was a total sellout. And um, so I didn't really understand the significance. Are these? No, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge event. I it, It's become a cultural moment. I'm so curious about it because I mean, number one, it's not like he was playing Inter Sandman or something. You know, it's, it's not he's not really playing heavy distortion with a wah wah, you know, with like a, a whammy bar. I mean, it's, it's, and it's Bob Dylan. He's got to be a God to them at that point. And the songs are not new. They've been on the radio for a year at that point. So are these young, these, these folks fans, are they young people? Who are the people who are so devout in their support of folk music that they will boo Bob Dylan? I would say they were mostly middle-aged. And, you know, I mean, it's signified by Pete Seeger, you know, just flipping out and wanting to stop it. And, and you know, Pete Seeger was like the old guard. And, and 
you know, in my book, I make the supposition that Bob just came up with this on the spur of the moment because uh, a very famous other ethnomusicologist, Alan Lomax, had tried to stop the Butterfield Blues Band from playing in a workshop on Saturday afternoon uh, for the same reason, that this was a folk festival. So, I mean, it's absurd. But the strange thing is that the booing was not just at Newport. When Bob finished that, he made a commitment that he was going to play rock and roll, whether people liked it or not. And so he got joined up with a group called Levon and the Hawks, which we know is the band, but they were just a bar band. And for the next year and a half, they played all through America and all around the world. And Bob would come out for the first half and play acoustic music, just harmonica and acoustic guitar. And the band would come out for the second half and they'd play rock and roll, and they'd get booed then too, and everywhere. They got booed in Texas, and they got booed in England, and they got booed in Australia. It was just like, it was absurd. And these are some of the greatest musicians of the 20th century. Right. And it was great music. And they're being too. booed by people. And they were playing extraordinary music. Amazing. I mean, you can hear some of those live albums, and it's it's like pre-punk. It's so tough and hard and great and and brilliantly loud and and they just somehow there was a resistance. Something about purity. Yeah. You're right about the punk. It's funny. When I was talking about it's not, you know, Inter Sandman, I was referring to the specific performance at the Newport Folk Festival, but you're right. I've seen, I've heard some of the music and some of it is reminiscent maybe of like Nirvana or something. Um, it, it was ahead of its time. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Now you were, so you were basically the tour manager. And one of the questions I had for you, I mean, you're, you're young at this time, you're Ivy League educated. But you know that line in Spinal Tap when uh, he's, the, the manager says, you know, there's, there's no sex, drugs, and rock and roll for Ian, baby. Um, were you accepted as kind of one of the guys? Because there's this awesome picture of you on the cover of the book with you and, uh, and Jerry Garcia and Janis Joplin. Um, were you seen as like one of the guys or were you seen as like a suit? What was that rapport like? Oh, I was definitely one of the guys, but I also had the obligation to get stoned musicians on an airplane uh, at 8.30 well, that could, that could sort of in the morning. In your butt. Right. I mean, so in some sense, it was not without some battles. I mean, I, you know, Levon came at me with a Bowie knife once when I was trying to get him out of bed at eight in the morning. And, and eventually... I just hired someone else to get the guys out of bed. You know, uh, we we were doing well enough that I didn't have to do that job anymore. That was the hard job. One of my favorite stories from uh, one of my favorite stories from the book was about um, this concert in San Francisco. The band was doing, and uh, Robbie Roberts apparently. I don't think you mentioned this in the book, but. He said at some point that it might have been because he the last time he had performed live, he had been booed, like we were just talking about, with Bob Dylan. And for whatever reason, he got really sick. And why don't you tell the story? So the band had been in Los Angeles recording their second album, the one with Night They Drove Old Dixie Down and Up on Cripple Creek and all those things. And then the very debut concerts that they'd ever done in their life as the band were booked at three nights at Winterland Arena in San Francisco. So that's like an 8,000 seat hall and it was sold out for all three nights. So that's a pretty big way to start. And, and of course, that was a lot of 
weight on them, right? What is this? Who are these guys? You know, they've been up in the mountains for two years. Um, so, Robbie, we arrive in San Francisco and we go to the hotel and Robbie immediately has like a 103 degree fever and starts throwing up. And so we go and do a sound check for the Thursday night concert without him, assuming he'll be fine. And we get back to the hotel and he's worse. It's 104 degrees and he's, he's really sick. And so this goes on for a while. And then eventually Bill Graham comes in, who was the promoter and says, well, maybe he's just needs a hypnotist. And I said, what? He said, well, sometimes people get freaked out, you know, and I know this hypnotist who's done this before. So he calls this guy. And by the time the hypnotist gets there, it's like eight o'clock and the opening act has already gone on stage. And this guy comes in and we're all sitting around Robbie's bed and he puts him into a trance in front of us. And then he tells him, oh, you're legs are going to feel like steel springs and your stomach will feel as calm as a mountain lake. And, and whenever you hear the word grow, all these feelings will increase in your body. And then he takes him out of the trance and Robbie looks around and said, I don't feel so bad. And so Levon says, well, let's go play some rock and roll. So they get us a police escort. We get rushed to the hall. We go on stage. And Robbie plays okay. He plays like he's on autopilot. Like he's some, but he plays, he does all the solos, he does everything. And when he comes off the stage, he said to Richard Manuel right in front of me. And Richard was much the hypnotist right off the off the corner of the stage behind the speakers. And Richard was next to the hypnotist. And then Robbie was another 10 feet away from the hypnotist from Richard. And he says to Richard, wasn't that weird between every song, that guy yelling grow all the time? And Richard said, oh, I never heard a word. So somehow the hypnotist had tuned into Robbie's brain in a way. And the next night, Robbie was totally fine. He played brilliantly. Amazing. So um, I watched in preparation for this, I watched The Last Waltz and I watched uh, like the first half of this other documentary, We Were Brothers or, or something. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, in The Last Waltz, I did not like Robbie. I actually didn't like any of them. I mean, I love the music. But when I watched the We Were Brothers, or I forget the exact name of it, I really liked Robbie. Robbie, And I saw him as this intellectual who was creative and passionate and full of ideas. And I'm wondering if that's just my perception or if you think there may be a reason for that perception. So Robbie was... An intellectual. I mean, he's a, a kid who who joined a rock and roll band at 16. You know, he joined Ronnie Hawkins. I don't know if I can say this on a podcast, but Robbie Haw- Ronnie Hawkins, who was a famous Canadian rockabilly, said, join up with me. You won't make much money, son, but you'll get more pussy than Frank Sinatra. And <laughs> that turned out to be true. Both. <laughs> uh, so Robbie had no school learning, but he wanted desperately to, to learn. So he read Flannery O'Connor, and I had been a poetry major at Princeton. So I gave him W.B. Yeats, and I gave him William Carlos Williams and Wallace Stevens and stuff like that, books like that. And he just absorbed it like a sponge. And he loved like foreign films. We used to watch, you know, Children of Paradise, Marcel Carnet's movie all the time, you know. Um, so I think your perception is right. I mean, maybe your perception of not liking him in the last waltz is 
maybe the way the interviews were done or something. I don't know. Yeah. I thought maybe, and this is my hypothesis, that the last waltz is them at the end. It's obviously the last, but it's them at the end of the road. They're, they're maybe they're tired and it's their last hurrah and they're burned out. And then maybe like they had, and some of them certainly had gotten caught up in drugs and, and, um, but, but when the other documentary was made, Robbie is older yeah, and he seems to have recaptured the, almost the winsomeness that he might've had when he was starting out. Yeah, I think so. So you, um, uh, this, this memoir, I mentioned, uh, Jerry Garcia and Janis Joplin. We've talked about Dylan and the band. Uh, there are other cameos, uh, Don Henley, um, Eric Clapton, uh, but why don't you tell us about your experience with the Rolling Stones and helping come up with the cover for Exile on Main Street? So I had done the concert for Bangladesh for George Harrison. Uh, I had done the production on that. And that that came off really well. And about two months later, I got a call from... Uh, the woman who was basically handling the Rolling Stones. And they had done a tour in 69, which had ended up in Altamont in a total disaster. And so they were determined they were going to have a different kind of way of approaching that. And so they asked me if I wanted to be... That's the, the concert where the... Somebody got Altamonte, killed. The, the Hell's Angels. Yeah, they provided security the, and somebody gets killed. Yeah, the Hell's Angels provided the security, and in the classic way, they beat the shit out of someone and killed them. You know, um, so I went. I was sent a ticket to go from New York to Nice because they were all in tax exile in the south of France. And they were recording an album called Exile on Main Street. And I got there and uh, Joe Bergman picked me up and took me to the villa where Keith was holed up in saint jean Cafra. And, you know, there was a meeting for one o'clock. And so I get there and at 2.30, Charlie Watts, wanders in and orders some orange juice and coffee and croissant. And by four, Mick has shown up acting as if the meeting was at four. And by six, right. there's no sign of Keith. It's six in the evening, you know. And so we're talking and I'm telling him about Bangladesh and the band and all that and how, how I would do it. And then so... Eventually, Keith, you know, Mick keeps sending the butler up to get Keith out of bed. And eventually Keith shows up and he's just kind of scratching his neck. All the signs of junkie alert. And I had just been through a pretty hard time with Eric Clapton at Bangladesh, getting him on stage. And I just thought, you know, spending three months worrying about that every day was not really my idea of a good time. So the next morning, I told Joe Bergman that even though I hadn't been offered the job yet, I, I, I was going to politely withdraw my name from the running. And I went back to California. And then the Stones came to L.A. And another one of Mick's assistants, Chris O'Dell, called me one day and said, uh, Mick's trying to figure out how to do the album cover. And I he loves the album covers you and Robbie did for the band albums. Have you got any ideas? Would you come over for dinner? So I went over to his place. He had a place in Bel Air that he was renting. And just as I was walking out the door, I grabbed a book called The Americans by Robert Frank, which is one of the great, most iconic books of photography and Robert Frank was a photographer who went across the country in 1955 and just took pictures of cowboys in bars with jukeboxes and preachers by the side of the river 
preaching and, and just this American stuff. And so I take the book, Mick provides a very nice dinner, and then I, I give him the book and I say, look, everybody knows who the Rolling Stones look like. Why don't you just put one of these pictures on the cover? Because it's just so American, and this album is a blues album. And he starts flipping through the book, and he's just like, he's entranced by the book. And then eventually he says, John, this is incredible. Let's get this guy to take our picture. I said, whoa, wait a minute. That's <laughs> not the idea. I mean, I, I said, I don't even know if he's alive, you know, I, I, and I wouldn't know where to find him. And I would give him all these excuses why, and trying to direct it back to my original idea. And no, he was, he, he wanted Robert Frank to take their picture. So he says, you can find him. You tell him the Rolling Stones are going to give him $20,000 to take their picture and he'll show up. I promise you. So I went home and the next morning, uh, I called in New York and some underground filmmakers and find that Robert Frank has moved to Mabu, Nova Scotia to live with his daughter. He'd been on welfare. He has nothing. He is at the end of his life in the middle of nowhere. And this is February. So I figure, okay, I, there must be some kind of directory assistance for Mabu. <laughs> I call up. It turns out Mabu, Nova Scotia has a party line. There aren't direct numbers for people. You call into central Mabu switchboard and then they plug you into the Frank house. And so I call in, I get this operator and she's very nice. She says, well, the, the, all the wires are down. There was a big storm last week. And I said, well, when will I be able to get a phone call through to that house. And she says, well, probably in a couple of months when the storms let up. I said, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> so she said, well, his daughter comes into town and, you know, once a week to pick up supplies. So why don't you leave a message at the general store? So she switches me over to the general store. And it just so happened his daughter was there. And they put her on the phone. And I said, I'm calling for the Rolling Stones. They want to offer your father $20,000 to take a picture of them in Los Angeles. And she says, is this for real? And I said, yeah, it's for real. And she says, okay, um, I'll have him call you back tomorrow, but he has to call collect. And I said, fine. So the next day he called and I said, this is what it is. And this is for real. And he said, oh, okay, well, I have to go down to New York to bum a camera from someone and then then you can send me a ticket to go out to california so i did he shows up at the la airport and he has this little eight millimeter film camera up to his eye and he's just filming everything and we go to the beverly hills hotel and they put him up in one of those bungalows they're really giving him the top treatment i take him up to mix house and they have this riotous dinner of Robert Frank telling all these stories of Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and all the beats that he hung out. And Mick is just eating it up. And, and so every night we go up to Mick's house. And one night I was in the library and I noticed Robert Frank is in the wastebasket, pulling stuff out of the wastebasket and putting it in his pocket. So that was kind of weird. And we, and he's always got this little Super 8 movie camera taking little bits, like 10 minute, 10 seconds snips. We go to the recording studio. He's always in the wastebaskets. So eventually, Marshall Chess, who was the manager, starts getting really pissed off. He says, this is costing me $1,200 a day to put him up. And there's no picture. Get him to take a picture for Christ. So I say, Robert, you got to organize the photo session. He says, well, I don't have a camera. I said, what? You don't have a camera? He said, well, go rent me a camera, a, a Bel Air camera. So I rented him a camera. He says, have everybody go down to the Grand Central Market, downtown L.A. So we go down to the Grand Central Market. It's totally chaotic. 
as usual, Keith is really late. The light is going. We get like three pictures, three snaps. And then Marshall Chess flips out and says, this is total bullshit. We're sending this guy home tomorrow. I answer. And, and so Mick says, well, pay him the $20,000 anyway. And Marshall Chess says, what? And he says, pay him the $20,000. Uh, for his years of service, he deserves it. So they paid him a check. That's cool. I sent him home. And I thought, well, that was interesting, but it was a total disaster. Two weeks later, the fully finished Exile on Main Street record cover for a double album shows up at John Van Hammersfeld's studio with all these little strips laid out, pasted on it, some of his old pictures, these little scraps of paper that Mick had been writing lyrics on. It's all like a collage, like a Rauschenberg cover, and it was totally there. And so then Mick was totally vindicated. The cover won a Grammy. And then Mick made the mistake of inviting Robert on tour with him with a, with a real film camera. And he made a movie called Cocksucker Blues, which was so outrageous that the Rolling Stones paid a lot of money to have it never been seen by anyone. <laughs> that is a great story. And it obviously became an iconic album cover. And I think it's cool that Mick w was willing to pay him, even yeah. when he thought it was a complete disaster. That was a, that was a really cool thing. Yeah, totally. And I have to say, now, you, you had this experience where you show up and Mick Jagger doesn't show up till four o'clock. And then, uh, uh, you know, Keith shows up two hours later and he's, and he's you know, obviously on drugs. Um, but they were at least the Rolling Stones. I've had experiences like that playing in like small time bands and they weren't the Rolling Stones. <laughs> so, I mean, consider yourself lucky. That's true. Um, They've got no excuse. <laughs> no excuse. They think they're, they all think they're Mick Jagger. Uh, so now I wanted to shift and ask you some uh, just general questions. One is about the general ethos of the 60s, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that kind of thing, and revolution. That What do you think now about that worldview in general? Well, it started out early in 63. I mean, I'm 73 years old, right? So I, I, I date you a bit. In 63, you, look, you look 35. So in 63, Bob Dylan was singing Blowing in the Wind. Uh, people were singing We Shall Overcome. The times there are changing these were very aspirational ideas. They were very positive. They were saying there needs to be change in the world. And a lot of it, needless to say, was around the civil rights movement. And the music and the movement were very united. They were very much of a piece. Um, if you listen to Bob Dylan, you probably listen to Martin Luther King, you know, and vice versa. So, that was very positive. By 68, from a political point of view, my generation got their heart broken two times in two months. Martin Luther King gets assassinated, and then we put all our hope into Bobby Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated. And it was it was truly like, well, screw politics, you know. And, and so a lot of people, including me, turned away from the activism of politics into the art world. And by the way, for the musician's point of view, a lot of them turned into taking some serious drugs. And that, of course, was its own tragedy because... I was lucky enough to, you know, to know Jimi Hendrix and spend a lot of time with Janis Joplin. And, and 
their death and and see Otis Redding at Monterey Pop. And th- those deaths were truly tragic. Now, Otis didn't die because of drugs. He died because of a stupid plane crash. But but Jimmy and Janice thought they could they could push it to the edge and it bit them in the butt, you know. So, I mean, I would say that the decade ended very differently than it started. A part of it was that, as I said, that heartbreak of having your political heroes killed. And and so that induced a certain kind of cynicism that, you know, by early 70s, Don Henley was singing Life in the Fast Lane. You know, I mean, it was a different deal. So you don't think that, like, the experiment, the whole flower power sort of experiment was destined to come crashing down, that you think it was like external forces that led to the, the cynicism? Yeah, I, I actually believe that if Bobby Kennedy had survived, he would have been elected. He would have beaten Richard Nixon badly. And you think about the world history going forward, that alternative history of someone saying, okay, we're getting out of the war now. We're going to make justice the the premier thing, and we're going to make racial reconciliation the most important thing. All the things that Bobby said on the primary trail, if he had been able to put that in to think it would have been a very different world in 1970. It wouldn't have been, there would have been no Watergate. There would have been none of the things that happened. The war wouldn't have dry, dragged on for another four years. It, all of that would have changed. So I think that was an extraordinary thing, which is not to say that the there weren't huge mistakes made. I mean, I talk, I use a reference to Richard Rorty in the book where I say that really when he makes the distinction between the kind of the reformist left and the cultural left, that when the, when the reformist left quit after 68 and left it to the cultural left, then that creates stupid stuff. And, and so that that sense of, well, you've got nothing to gain, you've got nothing to lose. Um, that's a that's a different situation. And, and that made a mistake. And, and of course, then you also have the additional thing of when Woodstock hit, to have 300,000 people in a cow pasture with no food and just for rock and roll, all of a sudden for Madison Avenue, their heads exploded. And so the hippie thing got somehow integrated into Woodstock Nation becomes the Pepsi generation. And it just became a marketing trope. (laughs) Right. Uh, So there's this uh, sentiment or idea that I, I think Daniel Patrick Moynihan probably first identified it. Andrew Breitbart popularized it. And you believe in it. And I do too. And it's that politics is downstream from culture. And it's something you mentioned several times in this memoir, but talk about it, what that means to you and, and uh, how you've seen that. Well, let me just give something that's much more contemporary. When I try and parse in my mind how the kind of Trumpist dialogue arose of this sense of what Angus Case called deaths of despair, you know, the why are so many people, you know, taking deep, bad drugs, killing themselves, drinking themselves to death, all that. I try and think, well, where, where did that all get started? And I, 
look back to 9-11, and then I look at what happened culturally right after 9-11. And so if, if, if we look at, because you, like me, are a fan of kind of television traumas, if we look at what happened, you get, you get The Wire, you get Sopranos, you get Mad Men, you get Breaking Bad, you get Succession, True Detective, Game of Thrones. What do they all have in common? They have an anti-hero. In other words, the bad guy is the person we're rooting for. Uh, and he may be a meth dealer, he may be a mafia chieftain, but he's nobody that you would actually want to hang out with. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you'd want to live with the family of succession. They would make you crazy. So what does that do? Well, if, if you think that everything is fixed and only the cheaters win, then that induces a certain kind of political turn of mind, which then leads to, well, why not put Donald Trump in there and let him kick some butt and, and that'll fix it. And of course it didn't, but it, that to me was the kind of ideological shift. You know, and that's an example of culture leading politics. And and to me, I completely I completely agree. I actually think that might be a conservative sentiment, but that's why I think violent video games actually could be one contributing factor to violence. And that's why I think that like, you know, um there was a responsibility for artists and people in entertainment. And so the, the position you're taking actually is is not normally what you get from Hollywood or it was a, they'll say like, hey, man, um, you know, he wasn't, you know, just because that guy wanted to impress Jodie Foster doesn't mean he took a shot at Ronald Ray, you know, or, or the catcher in the rye or whatever. I mean, isn't that basically making the argument that, in fact, works of art actually could lead to you have consequences? Absolutely. I mean, look, the, the songs of the early 60s were the songs we sang in demonstrations. They were ways of, of building solidarity. Um, they, they were positive, though. The times they are a changing. Get out of the way if you're trying to stand in the way. You know, don't stand in the doorway. So, I I believe art does have a responsibility, and I think we're in a particularly nihilistic age. Now, we may be escaping that now. It may be that Biden will bring some other point. And, and you know, I, I make the point in the book that in the early 50s, there was the same thing. It was called film noir. And all those movies, the bad guy always wins. <laughs> you know, you... You go in, double indemnity, let's kill your husband and we'll cheat the insurance company and we'll have a double win. Um, any Humphrey Bogart character from those early period, they're all cynical and corruption is everywhere. And that's the belief we have politically right now. And the culture put it there. And the culture has a responsibility yeah. to get it out of there and... You know, to me, culturally, the only positive thing I really see happening is LeBron James and basketball players saying vote. You know, I, I'm I'm looking more to them for cultural leadership than I am to Kanye West or or Jay Z. Yeah, it's interesting that it's not by and large, it's not musicians who are now driving the political or cultural discussion as much as it is athletes, that is an interesting turn of events. But I completely agree with you. Like, I think reality TV helped pave the way for the election of Donald Trump. And um, here we are, right? <clears throat> uh, let me ask you uh, another question. So I'm watching The Last Waltz and I'm listening to the night they drove old Dixie down, you know, and like my father before me, <clears throat> excuse me, like my father before me, I took a rebel stand. And then there's a, 
a scene where they're doing an interview with like Levon and, and, and Robbie, and there's a Confederate flag behind them. And I'm wondering if the band would be canceled today. Like if, if, if they did that today, if that would be seen as uh, you're no longer welcome in play company. And if so, what that, what that means, because, and then I'll shut up, but I, <laughs> but I think there's something to be said for an artist. I mean, take away the Confederate flag part, but there's something to be said for an artist telling a story um, about from a certain perspective that doesn't necessarily endorse all, all the bad things that go along with that perspective. Right. I agree. So let's dispense with the cult, the Confederate flag. That was Levon just being contentious and trying to be, he thought, put it in your face, you know, Marty, whatever, you know. But but put that aside. The night that they drove Old Dixie down to me is a great song, despite the fact and, and you could say, look, Faulkner wrote about a lot of weird stuff. It didn't mean that Faulkner was that kind of bad person. I mean, I think what Robbie tried to do was put himself in the place of an ordinary sharecropping dirt farmer. And what the notion of pride is when you feel you don't have anything to be proud about. And he was trying to yeah. negotiate that tricky thing. I think it's a very good song. I would be uh, sad if if it was a victim of cancel culture, but I don't think it has anything to do with that. And I mean, for me, a lot of what I have a trouble with is people thinking about things that were made in 1936 or 1945 and judging them by contemporary mores. You know, Muddy Waters singing I'm a Man, you know, he'd get thrown out of the bar today if he said some of those things, you know? Um, Louis Armstrong, all, all these people that I really admire, you know, they were pushing some boundaries there. And I mean, you could even apply that to people criticizing Ernest Hemingway for being misogynist, but he lived in a different time. But as a, but let me ask you this: as a as a liberal who's a creative person, does it trouble you that a lot of modern progressives today um, don't give? an allowance for that same artistic license that they would say, what they would say is this song is um, that culture does matter and that we need to break from the past. And that this song is like normalizing the idea of the lost cause and that we should have, you know, that we should have any tolerance for these traitors who were supporting. So, so, and you're making a very open-minded case, which is like, hey, we need to understand people. It's about ideas. That's uh, used to be a liberal idea. Does it bother you that today's progressives are not as open-minded? Yeah, it does. But I mean, Look, I would say I'm conservative in the sense that I like to conserve things. I think that America has this extraordinarily rich culture that it has created since the birth of the phonograph. And you can go through that culture and find lots of things that from the woke standard of 2021 sound objectionable. And if you feel you need to protect yourself from hearing that stuff, I think you're missing a lot. You're missing Bessie Smith. You're missing Robert Johnson. You're missing Muddy Waters and Sonny Boy Williamson and 
Billie Holiday and people just singing stuff that from contemporary standards of how men and women negotiate with each other are are all off. They're all crazy, you know, uh, and yet it's great art. Um, so you've had this amazing career, not only in one field, but like, you know, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, you were involved in the making of uh, Martin Scorsese's uh, Mean Streets and helping uh, create that and, and, and finance that. Uh, you went into the world of, of, of finance banking. Um, you've been involved in, in technology and academia, uh, never mind Bob Dylan and the band and all that. Um, it strikes me that in the modern world, reinvention and adaptability are very important skills. The days of working at a job for 40 years and getting the gold watch are probably over. But uh, talk about that, why you were able to do that, why you chose to do it, and maybe what we could learn from that. I think it's a sense of being open to change. I think a lot of times we get scared of change. And so for me, my life is a series of events where someone came up with an idea that sounded interesting that meant you would have to leave behind the comfortable world you were already living in and making a living in and take a chance on something new that you didn't know necessarily would make you a living. Uh, and But it seemed more interesting. So, I mean, the move for me leaving rock and roll and going to Hollywood was really a matter of after the concert for Bangladesh, pretty much everybody I knew who I would want to work for didn't want to go on the road anymore. Dylan was off the road. George Harrison didn't want to play. The band didn't want to play. The only band that was big in 1972 was Alice Cooper. And I was not interested in watching someone, you know, chew the head off a chicken every night. It just it was not my deal. So I took a chance and went to Hollywood. A, a guy named Jay Cox, who was a great writer for Time Magazine, gave me a name of, of a kid in Hollywood who had edited Woodstock named Marty Scorsese. And he said, you'd like him. He likes rock and roll a lot. So I looked him up when I got out to L.A. And he came over to my house and he brought this script called Season of the Witch. And he said, I've been trying to make this movie for three years and nobody will let me make it. And I think this could be a great movie. So I was so naive. I didn't know you weren't supposed to spend your own money on movies. I'd made some money in rock and roll and, and I had a friend who had some money. And so we put up 500,000 to make Mean Streets. You know, and I did it just off of looking at Marty's student films, which are really fun. And, and you can see them on YouTube and they're really worth seeing, especially see a, one called It's Not Just You, Murray. That's the one that sold me on Scorsese. And so I just did it. And, I, I, you know, later I learned there's something called OPM, Other People's Money. And that's how you're supposed to get money right. from Hollywood. <laughs> but it was too late by that time we'd made the movie. But fortunately, Marty made a great movie and we were able to sell it. And I'm still earning money from it 50 years later. And you know, would they have gotten part of what, you know, Scorsese does better than anybody is use like Rolling Stones music, you know, and these cool like slow motion scenes, which I just I just want to. I could just watch that. I don't need a movie. I just like just nothing but that. Could he have gotten some of that music without you? Or was that the, were you like a bridge to that world? That was, that was a big role that I played. Yeah. I mean, getting the role of permission to use Jumpin' Jack Flash was very hard, but it just so happened that Alan Klein controlled it. And he was the guy who had, I'd helped do the concert for Bangladesh for. He was the Beatles manager as well as the Stones manager. So that helped. And and to me, that's one of the great scenes in American movies when De Niro comes into that bar. 
with the stones underneath it. And it's in slow motion and so much red pumped into it. And it, it's, it's like iconic. So how did you, I, I was curious and I, I, I wish that I had taken, that I had actually been journaling in my life because I've not hung out with the Rolling Stones <laughs> or Jerry Garcia, but you know, I've seen some weird stuff and a lot of it is sort of in a haze of fog. And it's I'm, I'm talking about stuff that I did 20 years ago that I can't really remember <laughs> exactly how it went down. Um, how are you? And so I guess so, so part of the answer is some of the stuff's on film. You know, you can go back and watch the film and remember uh, what the concert for Bangladesh was like. But um, how are you able to recall so vividly things that happened, you know, many years ago? I have this weird memory. My my friends have always talked about it because I'm one of those people who used to, you know, at a dinner party, you know, you finish the wine and maybe a joint comes out and I, I end up telling a story, you know. And so these stories were pretty interesting. And at some point I just figured I'll write them all down. Well, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you took the time to visit with us today. And we've only scratched the surface on the stories. Everyone should get it. It's called The Magic Years, Scenes from a Rock and Roll Life. Jonathan Taplin, thanks, thanks for Matt. coming back on the news. It was a pleasure. <laughs>